All right, Jesus gave us the one important sign that would prove his claim, namely that he would come forth from the dead. You have shown historically that the evidence states that he did that. Now, people say, all right, we know that Jesus Christ claimed to be God, said that he would come forth from the dead, proving his claim, and he did, okay, according to the information. Now, what is the importance and what should people do with that information right now that are listening? Well, uh, if Jesus rose again from the dead, uh, the only reasonable conclusion uh, is that he was the person he claimed to be. Uh, there are some people around, for example, um, a very fine uh, and delightful Jewish rabbi uh, by the name of uh, Lapid, uh, who says, yes, Jesus rose from the dead, but he was not God. He was a special prophet that God sent uh, to the Gentiles. But surely, if we want to know who Jesus was, we're going to have to listen to him. If he rose again from the dead, he's in the best position to explain this. We can't take an explanation of someone who hasn't gone through this experience. And Jesus says, I rose again from the dead because I'm God. And therefore, we are, it seems to me, compelled to move in that direction. All right, summarize where we've come from in terms of this information. Where did we start, and where have we come to, and where are we moving with this? All right, we began checking out the New Testament documents to see if they sustain the value historically uh, necessary to get a clear picture of Jesus Christ. We, find, we found that they did. And we discover that the Jesus of these documents presents himself as no less than God. He rises again from the dead to prove that that's exactly the person he is. And that comes from the most solid eyewitness testimony. There are no philosophical ways to rule out the miraculous. And if we take the same kind of solid legal evidence that we have to use in courts of law, uh, we will find that this moves us directly toward the cross of Christ. We find ourselves compelled by Jesus' successful conquest of the power of death to make an absolute decision about this. This is a decision, one with the absolute decisions that we make every day of our lives and based on better evidence than most of the decisions. Is the evidence in history so strong that even Jewish scholars would agree that Jesus rose from the dead? One of the most remarkable features about the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus is that today one of the world's leading Jewish theologians, Pincus Lapid, who teaches in Israel, has declared himself convinced on the basis of the evidence that the God of Israel raised Jesus of Nazareth from the dead. I remember the first time I heard Lapid lecture when I was a student at the University of Munich under Pollenberg in Germany. I nearly fell off my chair when Lapid came to the conclusion of his lecture and said that he believed as a historian that Jesus rose from the dead. And I asked him, well, then why don't you become a Christian? And he said, because I don't see any inherent connection between Jesus rising from the dead and Jesus being the Messiah. Now, Pollenberg responded at that point, uh, I think that we would have to explore again the connection between Jesus claims to be the Messiah and God's raising him from the dead. Clearly, if God raised him from the dead, that seems to be pretty good reason for thinking that those claims were true. We're talking with uh, Dr. Anthony Flew, considered by many to be the world's foremost philosophical atheist, and Dr. Gary Habermas, a renowned Christian philosopher and historian, considered by many to be the foremost expert on the evidence for Jesus' resurrection. It's a fascinating discussion and a crucial discussion. And Tony, I want to know, what do you think about this evidence that Dr. Habermas just presented on the empty tomb? Do you go along with it? I don't think you should be apologetic about this at all. These facts are facts. And I could rather wish that in these topics more people were prepared to face facts rather than run away and say, oh, mustn't say that. No, this, this is a, a very impressive a uh, piece of argument, I think. That, so you accept the empty tomb? Well, I think it's, uh, this is an impressive testimony. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, because, uh, uh, you know, it's very difficult to get around this. But yeah. then now, it seems earlier, this just occurs to me, if the tomb is empty, what does that say to hallucination? 
Because or, hallucination would require that the body be in the tomb. Well, yeah, the first right. question is what happened to the body? That's your yeah, question. Well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, well uh, in a, a thing where um, we have um, no independent witnesses, um, there are all sorts of ways of removing bodies. You know, I'm uh, not going to offer a, a theory to me because I simply don't think one can uh, uh, reconstruct a story of what happened in a city um, all that long ago when we haven't got the sort of evidence that one might have today with the invention of cameras and all the rest of it. Why are scholars today so impressed with the fact of the passion narratives mm. in the Gospels. Why do they think that it's early? Why do mm. they think it's accurate? Why are they yeah. impressed? Tradition also comes into play when we talk about the passion story in the Gospel of Mark, our earliest Gospel. By the passion story we mean the final week of Jesus' suffering uh, and death and burial and resurrection. This is again significant because it means that this historical material does not date from the time of Mark's Gospel, but rather even earlier, before Mark's Gospel. And this pre-Markan passion tradition that Mark used uh, may go back as early as the A.D. 40s, within 10 years or so after the death of Jesus, and thus it's an extremely early and valuable source. Scholars think that there was such a source because when you read the Gospel of Mark, it tends to be composed of independent little stories about the life of Jesus that are strung together rather like pearls on a string. But when you come to the passion story, there you now have one long continuous narrative rather than these independent vignettes that just exist side by side. And that suggests that what Mark had here was an independent and early tradition that he himself employed in writing his gospel. How about communion? What's communion? The Christians got together and they decided to celebrate what? The Lord's death until he comes. Why would you celebrate somebody's death? It's because he's not dead anymore. We, he died for us to pay for our sins and he arose from the dead and he's coming back to get his church. Communion, baptism, makes no sense unless there's an actual physical resurrection from the dead and it goes right back to the time of Jesus. That's when it started. All the scholars admit that. What is it based on? It's the resurrection. Where did this thing called baptism originate? The ordinance of baptism, where did that come from? What is it? Baptism is a pictorial display of what? Of Jesus going down into the grave and you're identifying yourself with him that I die to myself. And then what? When you come out of the waters, it's coming out of the waters into newness of life with Christ to serve him. That's the resurrection. That's what baptism means. Where in the world did that originate? Why did it originate? It originated right at that time, and they said, because this is what Jesus wanted, and it teaches what he did. He was buried, and he arose from the dead. That's what baptism is all about, and it goes right back to that time. I want to close with something maybe that you haven't heard about before. There are also, I feel, about five different reasons that you have to account for that go right back to the resurrection. Number one, you have to account for the origin of the church. Here we are, we're a church. Where did it come from? Well, somebody started it. Well, who started it? A Christian. Where did he come from? Well, another person won him to the Lord. Where did that person come from? And you go on back in history and you finally come down to the start. Where is the start? Right about the time of Jesus. Right at the time of Jesus. Now, why did the church start? 
because they had said they had seen Jesus Christ alive and had shown them that he was God and he had told them as God to go out and tell everybody that he had risen from the dead, he had conquered death, he had paid for the sins of the world, he was the Savior, he could forgive their sins. And that's what they preached. You look at the sermons all through the book of Acts and you will find that that's what the fellow said. We saw him alive. We are witnesses of his resurrection from the dead. That's how the church started. That's the message that started the church. What in the world caused it? Could only be the resurrection of Jesus. That's what they said. There's something else. Do you realize that right at that time, we went to Sunday worship? And who went to Sunday worship? Orthodox Jews changed the day that they worshiped from Saturday to Sunday. Why? That's kind of an earth-shaking event. They kept it for over 1,500 years in the Old Testament, and all of a sudden, one day, they woke up and said, we're doing it on Sunday, not on Saturday. Why? Because they had nothing else to do. They said, we want to commemorate this day as the Lord's Day. This is the day that he rose from the dead. We will gather together. We will worship on this day. You give me any other reason that beats that one for why all of a sudden they started worshiping on Sunday. There is none. How about extra or non-Christian mm -hmm. sources? People often ask about non-Christian sources for the Gospels, and I think that behind this question lies a misconception that laymen have about the New Testament that needs to be rooted out first, and that is this, that somehow the New Testament is a single book which is written by Christians and therefore unreliable and not credible, but if there were evidence outside this book, ah, that would be real evidence, that would be credible. And this, I, I think, is just a complete misconception about what the New Testament originally was. Lay people need to understand that originally there was no such thing as the New Testament. The New Testament wasn't assembled into a single volume until a few hundred years after the death of Jesus. What there were originally was simply separate, independent documents in the Greek language coming down out of the first century there were gospels, there were letters, there were uh, histories of the early church, there was an apocalypse. All of these independent documents in the Greek language handed down out of the first century telling this remarkable story of Jesus of Nazareth. And what the church did was it collected together the earliest of these documents, the most reliable of them, and put them under one cover and called it the New Testament, so that by the very nature of the case, our earliest and most reliable sources for the life of Jesus are found in the New Testament. To ask what evidence is there outside the New Testament and to discount the New Testament evidence itself is to prefer later secondary derivative sources to the earlier primary sources, which is simply bad historical methodology. So the question that we need to be asking is not what extra biblical sources are there for the life of Jesus, although that's interesting. The real question is how credible are these documents when we examine them for what they really were, not inspired holy texts, but simply independent manuscripts handed down to us out of the first century about this man, Jesus of Nazareth. And when we examine them using the ordinary canons of historical inquiry, I think they come away looking pretty good as historical sources for the life of Jesus. And these sources are only confirmed, but not contradicted by the extra biblical sources that exist. I was stunned, frankly, to hear in the ABC special one of the scholars' interviews suggest that the earliest disciples may have been prompted to come to believe that God had raised Jesus from the dead because of Greco-Roman myths about dying and rising gods.
And the reason I was surprised, you see, is because this was a hypothesis that was bandied about in the so-called history of religions school of thought back at the close of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century. But the school soon collapsed and has been virtually universally given up today among New Testament scholars. So that the idea that the disciples uh, came to believe in the resurrection of Jesus on the basis of Greco-Roman myths is simply obsolete. Generally, New Testament scholars today recognize that the proper framework for understanding Jesus of Nazareth is not Greco-Roman mythology, but rather it is first century Palestinian Judaism. And it is against the background of Judaism that the prophet from Nazareth is properly to be understood. And the whole movement of the Jewish reclamation of Jesus, of understanding the Jewishness of Jesus, is testimony to this fact. Now, why did that history of religion school collapse? Well, primarily two reasons. Number one, the parallels were spurious. In fact, there are no parallels to the resurrection narratives or the empty tomb narratives in Greco-Roman mythology. These uh, dying and rising gods did not concern historical figures at all. They were merely mythological symbols of the crop cycle. The crops dry up and die in the hot, arid, mid-eastern summer, and then they come back to life when the, the uh, winter and spring rains come. And it wasn't thought at all that these were applied to historical individuals. Indeed, really, they didn't concern resurrections at all. These gods like Tammuz and Adonis and Osiris didn't really return to life, didn't really come back to, to life from the dead. They still existed in the afterlife. So that it's really a complete misnomer to think of these as parallel to the empty tomb and appearance narratives and the belief in the resurrection of Jesus. But secondly, there's no causal connection between these myths and the earliest disciples. You see, these myths were known in Judaism, and Jews found them utterly abhorrent. They were, they were blasphemous to Orthodox Jews. And the idea that the earliest disciples of Jesus would sincerely come to believe that Jesus of Nazareth was risen from the dead because they had heard these myths about Osiris and Adonis and, and Hercules is as absurd as your coming to believe that some friend of yours is risen from the dead because you saw the movie E.T. and E.T. came back to life in the movie. It, it's just uh, historically absurd to think that these men would sincerely have come to believe Jesus was risen from the dead on the basis of these myths and then be willing to go to tortuous deaths in attestation to the truth of that belief. And it certainly wouldn't explain James and Paul. Well, that's exactly right, because these unbelievers like James, Paul, were not uh, believers in Jesus when they saw these appearances. Thomas. Exactly. Why, why do you think that uh, the evidence shows, okay, he was put into the tomb, why do you think that the tomb was empty on the third day or a few days after Christ died? Let's go the opposite direction. Why do I think it was empty? Yeah. In other words, get, what's the evidence that shows that it was empty? Oh, oh, I thought you were going to say... Why was it empty? I was going to say, because he's raised. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, okay, so evidence surprised. for the empty tomb. Well, the one hint I just gave is that we do have some early accounts, a, a creedal passage in Acts 13 and 1 Corinthians 15 on Paul's sequence, but a couple other things. Uh, the Jews admitted the empty tomb, and we have three sources, not just Matthew, but we have Justin Martyr and Tertullian. All three tell us that uh, the Jews admitted the tomb was empty. Uh, the fact that Jesus died in the same city that the disciples did their earliest preaching. Everybody realizes that early Christian preaching happened in Jerusalem. I don't know if there's anybody who disagrees with that. And yet, there's a problem. The city where he died is the city where they began preaching a few days later. If that tomb is full, don't you think somebody would say, uh, fellas, we got a little problem here, this little matter of a body. So, bad place to be preaching. They should have been preaching in Galilee or Rome, but not Jerusalem. So you've got the city of Jerusalem as an evidence, you've got early attestation, you've got the Jews admitting it, and you know there's a critical historical principle, what your enemies admit is usually true. It's, it's called the principle of enemy attestation. And I could throw some others in there too. If, you, if Rudolf Boltmann is right, and the New Testament, if the Gospels are Monday morning quarterbacking, reading 
ideas of 80-ish AD back into the Gospels, you don't pick women as your Why? witnesses. And I don't want to offend people in the crowd here, but in the first century, a woman could not testify in a court of law. Jewish writing said women are liars. And the interesting thing is, Luke 24, 11, when the women come back from the tomb and tell the disciples, Luke 24, 11, they thought they were spreading gossip. They thought they were spreading tales. So if I'm writing this story and, and retrojecting it back from 80-ish AD to 30 AD, I don't pick women as my prime witnesses. So there's another big problem. Um, those are just some of the evidences for the tomb. You've got the women, you've got early attestation by Paul, you've got the Jews admitting it, and Jerusalem is the city. That's, that's a big no-no. You don't preach in the city where the body's in the tomb. There's, there's four that I'd love Tony to respond. All right, next question. Uh, my question's for Dr. Flew. Uh, one of your fellow countrymen, C.S. Lewis, came to Christ uh, late in life, as you know, and he came there because he uh, got tired of listening to himself uh, point out uh, what evil existed in the world and realized if there was evil, he had to have a referent uh, that was good, an ultimate good uh, from which to contrast evil. Um, I'm wondering, in listening to, uh, to you talk tonight and answer these questions, sir, uh, whether or not you've wondered or worried about putting yourself into a sort of metaphysical straitjacket over the years, and if not, what evidence would, take, uh, would it take uh, to be presented to you uh, to give yourself to Christ? Um, uh, well, uh, I'm not sure how one goes from there, but it may be of interest to you to know that I um, was acquainted with C.S. Lewis um, in my time at the University of Oxford, both as a student and a graduate student. Um, I went frequently to meetings of the Socratic Club, an organization which he founded and for certainly through most of the 40s and the 50s, chaired. Uh, you might also be interested to know that in his later life, uh, he became very distressed about evil uh, because, basically, he was confronted with the choice. Uh, are things uh, good because God says so? Or does God approve of them because they were good? Mm -hmm. And he couldn't see the way out of any way other than saying that absolute power is its own justification, as Calvin and others said. And in view of the fact that uh, the traditional religion is committed to the idea that most of God's creatures are going to be tortured forever for the things that he <coughs> makes them do, the, the whole of Christian theism is a nightmare to me. And one of the reasons why I am so concerned about these arguments, because I see the existence of the Christ as a nightmare. Kind of, because far from being good the, on the actual record, and if you say only Calvinists believe this, I can refer you to the passages in Aquinas where he says that God created people and is the ultimate cause of including of the behavior for which he is proposing to torture them forever. Yeah, the, the, you still don't answer the question though, and no. that is what would it take for you to cross the line because you did have a guy show up in history and you do have the historical evidence that uh, he was killed, he was put into a tomb, and uh, he appeared to his disciples, and uh, the fact is you are not doing anything with the evidence. It's one thing to say, I don't believe it, that's an assertion. It's another thing to say, uh, here's evidence to back up my assertion to knock your assertion. No, um, what I, uh, uh, I would regard, or I do regard, all these things, the evidence uh, uh, of what was going on in Jerusalem as baffling and inexplicable. And I, but I only think that it becomes a, uh, that I would have a reason to believe that the explanation is that resurrections, ac resurrection actually happened if I accepted the uh, background of, um, well, basically what at least the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees believed, the whole tradition of the Old Testament. But it, I don't. Gary, you want to respond to that? Do you have to be a, a Jew to believe that uh, Jesus actually rose from the dead? 
No, and I think a number of people have come to believe, I mean, I won't give the, the biographies, but there's a number of people, C.S. Lewis is one, who have come to believe because of the evidence. And uh, I, I think, and back to the question, I think Lewis was correct that the biggest problem on the issue of evil, on morality, and I was, I was serious when I said, this man is a very moral person. But Lewis's problem was, what is your ground for if you have a problem with evil, these evil things are going on, why are they going on? You can't say that unless you have an absolute moral standard of good. At least I think so. And I think that's a problem on the moral thing. As far as, as, far as him coming to Christ, I don't know, I can see that happening. He's a, he's a pretty good guy. Look, if it, if it could happen to Paul and James, you folks just keep praying for him. <laughs> Just well, keep praying well for what I was saying is that the basis of, of, of the evidence kind of pushing you over the line. In other words, we're not talking about mathematical equations here where you yeah. just put 2 plus 2 equals 4 because then you're putting in the ingredients. History is probabilistic, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So the fact is, is that when you probabilistics, like going into court in a sense, when you get enough testimony, you, beyond a reasonable doubt, not 100% certainty, the fact is you should intellectually be over here and come kicking and screaming to Christ. As Lewis said, he did. He said, I came kicking and screaming the most reluctant convert in all of England. Look, Tony, you got married, okay? You were talking about your wonderful marriage and it sounds delightful, but you know, in, in analyzing how people get married, that's not an absolute mathematical certainty. Boy, you're projecting, she's projecting, and you're gathering evidence on that woman and you're saying, does she really love me? You can't get inside of her mind 100%. You can only take the data that you're getting. And you made an ultimate commitment to her in the sense, I'm going to marry you, and you said, I do. All right? And you did that, I think, on far less evidence than you have got for Jesus rising from the dead. Keep praying. Talk to me. <laughs> All right.